Uh, my name is Herbert Walusimbi. I'm the senior legal officer with LDC, and I'm going to be the moderator for this session. But before I delve into the neat gritties of uh, this particular session, allow me to call on our chairperson, Rule of Law Committee, uh, Mr. Evans Ogada, to make a few introductory remarks and also uh, maybe introduce the members of the committee. Council, please, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for um, uh, Mr. Walusimbi for inviting us. Uh, may I thank you? And on behalf of the president of the East Africa um, Law Society, President Fauz, uh, the committee members, the CEO, Mr. David Sigano, uh, the Secretariat, thank you very much to those who are joining in. We welcome you. The conversations that we continue to have uh, relate to the rule of law. The South Africa Law Society continues to urge and to support uh, the rule of law within the region. We will continue to uh, impress on partner states and on uh, all that are concerned within the region to abide by the rule of law because without the rule of law and adhering to the rule of law, all else will not matter within the region. So I welcome you. We are going to have a profitable discussion, of course, enabled by our good moderator, Mr. Herbert Walusimbi. We wish you a good, fruitful uh, period during the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson, uh, for the kind introduction and laying foundation for the discussion. Our colleagues, just like the topic suggests, uh, today's latest discussion uh, on the rule of law uh, series in the East African region is going to be a discussion on the two CME screens, that is the freedom of assembly and association. I call them CME screens because without one, you cannot enjoy the other. We have witnessed a number of uh, happenings across the East African region, which have occasioned the shrinking of the space for enjoyment of these freedoms. And as a communion of attorneys across the region, we cannot just sit back, hold our hands and hope for the better. The freedoms are fundamental to the reign of law, and to the survival of our profession, which you call a noble profession. Uh, for the benefit of, of our listeners, we have a distinguished team of speakers who are going to take us through the discussion. Uh, allow me to introduce one by one, and as I introduce one at a time, I'll call on the, the speaker to, uh, to briefly greet our listeners. Uh, for starters, allow me to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Waremela. He's an advocate of the High Court of Uganda uh, with a vast experience in the country. He has uh, equally participated in litigation at a regional level and at the international level. Dr. Waremela is a, a PhD holder from the University of Western Cape. He has been a doctoral researcher at the Institute of International Comparative Law in East Africa, in Africa, I beg your pardon, uh, at the University of Pretoria, South Africa. He was a postdoctoral research fellow uh, uh, at the Faculty of Law, University of Western Cape in South Africa from 2021 to 2022. Dr. Daniel is currently a postdoctoral fellow at a college of law in the University of South Africa, at the University of South Africa. Attorneys from Uganda who are listed on Council of African Court on Human and People's Rights. 
is also uh, one of the nine Ugandan lawyers who have been admitted to the list of counsel of the International Criminal Court. It is quite a resume, and uh, you'll agree with me, our listeners, that we are in safe pair of hands. Dr. Walemela, kindly greet our listeners briefly. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know whether I want my video to be unmuted. Uh, if you don't, it's okay. But thank you very much for this opportunity. I would like to thank the uh, East Africa Law Society, especially the Rural Law Committee, uh, that asked me to join this conversation. Uh, it's a very important conversation that uh, we need to have, not, by, not only by the way, in the East African region, but in the African region. There are just a couple of countries uh, uh, that are abiding by the tenets of the rule of law. Uh, most of the countries, of, of most of the 54 countries uh, are not abiding by those uh, key tenets of the rule of law. And uh, today uh, 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 we will tackle the aspect of association, uh, but just like you mentioned yourself, uh, you cannot tackle association, the freedom of association without the discussing the freedom of assembly. Uh, but I would also like to add that you can also not discuss those two without discussing uh, free speech. Uh, so I would, I would like to thank you. And uh, uh, I, I want to thank everybody who has come in here to uh, have this conversation with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doctor. I entirely agree with you. Our next speaker will be uh, uh, Mr. William Ernest Kivuyo. Counsel William Ernest Kivuyo is an advocate of the High Court of Tanzania with over 10 years' experience litigating municipally within Tanzania and the East African region and international as well. He has litigated a number of high profile cases within the region and in Tanzania that has contributed to the growth of jurisprudence in the region and in Africa as a whole. He holds a master's degree uh, in intellectual property. Uh, and because of that expertise, he has been able to provide consultancy services for the World Intellectual Property Organization uh, for a number of years. Mr. Ernest, Mr. William Ernest Kibuyo has joined us to share his perspectives on what can be done better in Africa for the foundation for enjoyment of the freedoms as clearly pointed out at inception. And so William Ernest Kibuyo, please uh, say a word or two to our listeners. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Hubbard, uh, and thank you, Mr. Fikalo Society, for having invited me to this very important uh, discussion. Um, freedom uh, of uh, association is very critical and fundamental in any democratic society. So I look forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Kibuyo. Our other speaker will be Council Vivian Owuya. She's an advocate of she's an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. She has a master's in law, in particular with a bars in human rights law from Central European University. She's the co-founder of the feminists in U in Kenya, an influential feminist with collective works to ensure that there's gender parity in Kenya. Council Vivian has spent over eight years working with and supporting marginalized communities, not only in Kenya, but also in the region. Uh, Council Vivian Owea, kindly uh, a word or two to our listeners. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the East Africa Law Society for the great invitation into the space to be in conversation with 
amazing lawyers from um, across East Africa around these very important subjects, such as, uh, you know, the freedom of association. I think it's a very timely topic. So thank you so much for creating the space. I also want to extend uh, my thanks to the participants who are listening to us today. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And I look forward to the conversation. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Council Vivian Oya. We are similarly joined by uh, Council Christine Nkonge. Council Christine Nkonge has a wealth of experience in litigation, in uh, promotion of the rule of law. She has done a lot of work to ensure that uh, there's a reign of rule of law. She has similarly taken steps to ensure that uh, East Africans participate in activities in a manner that aligns to their aspirations as a region, in a manner that ensures that the rights and freedoms that are protected under the different international instruments are enjoyed. Council Christine Nkonge kindly uh, a word or two to our listeners before uh, we start. Thank you uh, for your kind introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. As has been uh, said, my name is Princeton Konge, a counsel uh, of 15 years from the High Court of Kenya, passionate about conversations around rule of law. And I want to thank the East Africa Law Society for extending uh, me this opportunity to share with you and other like-minded individuals um, a discussion on this conversation. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Council Kristin. Thank you so much. It is very important that before we start this conversation, we put it in context. Like Doctor pointed out as he was uh, greeting our listeners, the two freedoms that are going to be a subject of this discussion have a symbiotic relationship with a number of rights and freedoms that are guaranteed under the different uh, constitutions of the East African countries. The genesis of visa freedoms beyond the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, in particular, Article 21 and Article 22, which enjoins or obligates states in the East African region to ensure that the people in their borders enjoy the freedom to associate and assemble, to exercise their beliefs, whether politically, economically, or socially. Now, to, 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 to give a deeper view of these freedoms, one needs to look at the general comment, in particular 37 of the Human Rights Committee, which enjoin states to ensure, to take steps to ensure that they protect and provide an environment for enjoyment of these freedoms. But the reality in East Africa has been uh, different, like I said earlier on. We have had uh, legislations passed that, for lack of better words, are geared towards curtailing freedom of association and assembly. We have seen uh, Police, for example, in Kenya, violently cracked down on the protests by Kenyans, in particular in Nairobi, against the hike in prices of foodstuffs. We have seen a hastily, despite your view, by the way, a hastily promulgated principal legislation in Uganda that bars uh, same sex practices and uh, richly criminalizing the practices and anything associated with it. Now, a human rights perspective applied to these practices uh, clearly gives an impression that the freedoms which are subject of today's discussion are going to be curtailed. And that takes me to, 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 to my first question to the panelists, in particular, In particular, uh, Council Vivian Oya. 
please, given your experience, 15 years, I beg your pardon, over 10 years of practice, you have seen what has been happening in the region. What are these emerging trends and patterns, and patterns, I beg your pardon, that are occasioning the shrinking of the space for freedom of association and assembly in the region? They are highlighting developments in the different uh, countries within the East African region. Councilor Vivian Oya, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Council Gabriel. Um, please allow me to share my screen. I've prepared a short presentation that I'm going to, um, in the next um, 10 to 15 minutes, just discuss uh, quite uh, broadly the, the definition of the freedom of association, discuss its limitations, and then immediately delve into the, the um, emerging trends that we are seeing across East Africa. So please give me just a few minutes to share my screen, and then I can begin. Okay, Council Vivian, uh, our IT team, please kind of allow Council Vivian to do the need for. Um, Council Gabriel, can you see my screen? Is it visible on your end? Uh, Council Vivian, your screen can uh, be seen. When are we okay, have great. freedom of association in East Africa, emerging trends and patterns across the region? Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, first, I'm going to start just defining what the freedom of association is and this right uh, this is a fundamental human right that is uh, you know that gives us the power and the autonomy to first of all to form um, um i break off at any point am i still audible Yes, yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> great, great, great. So uh, the freedom of association is a fundamental human right that um, allows us to, first of all, form groups, associations, um, political parties, to form trade unions, to form NGOs. And once we form those spaces for, uh, once we form those spaces, it allows us to also organize within those spaces to achieve um, common objectives. Um, this 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 right as well protects us from you know the arbitrary restriction of our of our voice arbitrary restriction of our organizing restriction of our you know of our personhood as well and therefore it opens up the space uh, for enrichment of political dialogue of social dialogue um, uh, in a democratic society but this right also gives effect or gives meaning to other rights as as um, the learned councils have mentioned, and particularly the right of freedom, the freedom of assembly and the freedom of expression. Um, and in fact, you will notice that in international, regional and some uh, national laws, you will notice that these rights are often described, um, you know, very closely or very consecutively to each other, uh, because they are very interrelated in their nature. Um, I will use an example. Um, say you are organizing for good governance, right? So you create an NGO that um, that pursues good governance. You have to be able to express the need for that good governance. And if there is bad governance, you would um, also need to be able to say assemble or picket or protest against that bad governance. In a similar way, if you're organizing within a trade union, um, say particularly for the rights of domestic workers. Say you want to, um, you are agitating for their for the, for an increase in their domestic wages. Um, for, you want fair wages for them. You, you should be able to articulate that, freely express that without any, you know, targeted harassment on your personhood, but also um, being able to. Uh, um, um, pursue industrial strikes in that regard. So in that way, we see how the freedom of assembly and the freedom of expression and associ association um, intersect with each other. 
I will throughout my presentation be looking at the African Commission guidelines on freedom of association and assembly in, in Africa. Now, the freedom of association is not an absolute right. It is limited. It can be limited on certain um, grounds, on certain instances. And because it is such a fundamental human right, you'd often, um, or the courts would often subject any limitation to this uh, to this right to very high scrutiny. You'd have to, you know, provide very justifiable reasons why you think that, you know, why, for example, you're not registering a certain association, why you don't want, um, you know, a certain group to protest. You'd have to provide very, you know, very strong just justification and reasons um, for your limitation. But um, the, the following are the grounds that um, this right can be limited, particularly in when we are in pursuit of national security. Um, so the, say there is war, there are threats of war, then this right is um, of most likely to be limited um, in the pursuit of public order, in the pursuit of public emergencies, uh, particularly for the COVID-19. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw in different ways this freedom being limited. But as we continue with the presentation, we will show how um, um, you know, governments sometimes weaponize these grounds to actually um, arbitrarily, arbitrarily limit um, the freedom of association. So also when um, your, your right to associate uh, interferes with the rights of others. And I will use an example. So if you want, say, to if you want to create an association that you know has ethnic that ethnically that targets ethnic minorities then that would mean that your right to associate infringes on the on the right of you know other people if you want to um organize in a way that is discriminatory would that would also um um you know interfere with the rights of others and i will put a, a comparative a global comparative analysis um for this particular case uh, we see in the united states for example uh, groups such as the kkk which are anti-black and you know very racist groups wanting to organize and seeing how, you know, seeing that that's their first amend amendment right, and, you know, they want to um, um, exercise their freedom of speech, their freedom of association, but, you know, we see them getting stopped by the law because they are organizing is essentially premise on you know discriminating other people as well so we also have public safety as well uh, you know as another ground for the limitation of the freedom of association now the court um, would often uh, have a, the court has a framework with which it um, um, it assesses the 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 uh, the court has a framework in which it assesses the ways in which um, that the freedom of association can be limited, right? So there's often a balance in which the court tries to reach between the legitimate aims that we've already discussed vis-a-vis -vis the need to protect this uh, particular freedom. So this is often called the necessity of the proportionality test, and the court would often ask the following questions. Um, is there a legal basis for the measure limiting that the right? So um, the court would check whether the these, um, you know, whether that measure to limit uh, the freedom of association is rooted in the law, you know, is it premised on the law, is it founded on the law? The court would also ask whether that limitation pursues a legitimate aim, right? The aims, the legitimate aims that we've just discussed. So, you know, pursuit of public order, public safety, um, you know, national security and the like. <clears throat> Um, the court would also check that, you know, if it is a legitimate aim, is it necessary to achieve that um, legitimate aim? So um, the court would explore whether um, that measure is overly burdensome and if it is, are there less restrictive alternatives that would, you know, be helpful in, you know, um, not limiting that freedom of, to associate. Uh, the court would also look at the um, whether that measure is proportionate and the court would ask whether those benefits outweigh the harm so if um you know the benefits do not outweigh the harm then it is not proportionate uh, but the court we are also seeing um increasingly very very new decisions that actually um that actually ensure that um that limitation respects the principle of equality and it does not um you know that limitation is not discriminatory in that regard but please keep in mind the following um points as we will be using them in real life scenarios that we see across east africa right so um 
Now let's talk about the emerging trends um, in freedom of association, assembly and expression that we are seeing across East Africa. And um, please also, you can just look at the, the visuals that I've put in this, that I've put in this presentation because um, I'm just trying to accommodate visual learners like myself. Uh, yeah, so um, the emerging trends uh, in, in freedom of association across East Africa. So the first one is um, organizing in the digital age, right? So first, I just want to start by acknowledging that um, that that you know with the advent of the digital age with the advent of technology and digital platforms we have seen a great you know a very, very vast expansion in the freedom of association the freedom of expression and the freedom of you know assembly in that um especially for ma marginalized communities who would often not find spaces for organizing within uh mainstream digital within mainstream media so they have found on digital platforms spaces to advocate um, for, for, the, for their experiences, spaces to add voice to their experiences. You know, just going on Twitter as a marginalized person, now you can, with one tweet, reach a politician and, you know, um, share what your perspectives are on certain issues. Um, we are seeing the rise of digital protests, right? So people mobilize each other on digital platforms and actually take to the streets to exercise their freedom of assembly. We have seen worker solidarity across, um, you know, across the globe that you know workers um say in in seashells um you know are uniting with workers in kenya and workers you know in uganda and workers in rwanda and and so on and so forth so i do feel that with the with the rise of technology we have indeed seen um an expansion of these rights, uh, but also I do see the internet as a double-edged sword. That on the one side we have all these gains, but on the other side we having uh, you know increasingly autocratic governments and authoritarian governments actually recognizing that you know what uh, marginalized communities actually have voice and they are visibilizing the fact that you know governments are actually oppressing them, and so governments are in turn retaliating to close down this um, you know digital civic space. And uh, I'm just going to speak very, very shortly about how these, um, you know, these autocratic uh, regimes are, are unfolding on the internet. So the first case is a case of, you know, the case of internet shutdown. So internet shutdown is essentially when a government makes an executive order that all, um, you know, um, forms of communication on the internet are to be shut down or to be closed off. So therefore, that means no access to the internet, no access to information, no access to you know community. The way we are social beings, we do not have therefore access to community, and so. We saw, uh, you know, we saw a very, uh, you know, very important case in the 2021 um, Ugandan elections, where the internet was shut down through an executive order, and therefore people could not, you know, um, monitor the elections. People could not uh, have even access to their bank accounts. People could not, therefore, access healthcare. People could not, uh, you know, associate freely. People could not protest in that regard. So, uh, and I really, and I really appreciate the. East Africa Law Society for actually approach, approaching the, the East African Court of Justice to actually articulate and to actually uh, pray for a declaration that um, such an executive order is unconstitutional, but also hold the Secretary General of the East African Community to account by letting, you know, by letting the office know that you know they have the mandate to stop governments from using um you know their power arbitrarily so that's on internet shutdowns but also another trend that we are seeing is surveillance surveillance is basically the amassing of incredible or you know very very you know very vast or very yeah very vast um um technology by governments to actually monitor the the to, to monitor their citizenry to monitor you know who gets into their borders right so um surveillance is used um particularly on digital platforms to monitor not just activists but to also monitor uh, people as they organize on the internet people as they share information on the internet and we saw um during the covid 19 pandemic particularly in kenya the use of facial recognition technologies those are frts the use of um frts to basically spy on you know um, um, 
so FRTs and contact tracing tech to basically try to see, um, you know, who had been in contact with, uh, you know, a person uh, who had COVID and the like. So we do know that, as we have discussed, that, you know, public emergency is a way in which freedom of association can be limited. But we see the government going overboard. We see the government unjustifiably using technology to actually surveil on its citizenry. So that's another trend um, that's coming out across East Africa. But also we have censorship where um, you know people cannot access information on the internet. So because tech companies particularly want to continue operating in East Africa or wherever they are based, they have taken to um, um, you know accepting government um, government decisions or government recommendations to ban certain content, to ban certain voices, to sense censor certain information, right? So in that way, we see that um, the freedom of association. Then, if you don't have and, and the freedom of expression as well, if you do not have, which includes therefore the the right to access information, then that means that um, those freedoms are um, violated. Let me take a sip of water. Great. So, um, so the rise of incel culture as well. This is a personal favorite to talk about because I see it all the time um, as I as I as I organize and as I, as I do my work. Incel culture is essentially a movement uh, or a culture of people or, or a culture whereby people, particularly men, you know, um, use. Um, heavily misogynistic, heavily sexist and heavily racist um, terminology on the digital platforms to make sure that um, women cannot have voice, women cannot have autonomy, women's you know, sexual expression as well is policed on the internet. And the problem with incel culture is that um, women, sexual and gender minorities therefore cannot organize, cannot exist fully on the internet as they are meant to be, right? So um, so that's why we see then cases, rising cases of online gender-based violence, rising cases of the non-dissemination, uh, you know, non-consensual dissemination of intimate images in what we call revenge porn, and also what we say, you know, the images are leaked, but really, um, I avoid using the term, you know, the images are leaked because they are not leaked, they are intentional shared on digital platforms with the aim of you know embarrassing um, women embarrassing the survivor um, you know, shaming them um, and the like so this is also just a call to action for us on the call to just reflect on our participation of sharing so if you see on telegram that say this influencer has their images leaked on on telegram do you want to see it and when you see it do you share it right that's something we can just reflect on and also um, reflect on how that infringes on the freedom of expression of those people but also something we're exploring and something that's coming out um, on digital uh, of around organizing in the digital age is uni universal jurisdiction on the internet what does that look like right knowing that the internet you know the question really is who governs the internet so universal jurisdiction is essentially um, um, when governments can claim jurisdiction for a crime even when it doesn't happen within um, their jurisdiction so um, for for cases such as say you have you know someone has shared your intimate images in seashells and you're based here in Kenya who has regulatory authority around that and sometimes these uh, perpetrators sometimes they they hide under anonymity right so you don't know who truly shared your images sometimes you don't know who is distributing that child pornography right so it's often Often it's a question that I'm also exploring, and I'm hoping that we can um, have those conversations on this on this webinar. But that's also something that is emerging. Um, that's also something that is emerging um, as we organize in the digital age. Give me a minute as I drink water. Great. So um, that's on that. That's on organizing in the digital age. Now I will talk about uh, another trend that is emerging, and it's criminalization of certain forms of association. Now, um, across East Africa, we are seeing, you know, the emergence of laws that target particularly LGBTIQ people and communities, sex workers as well, and how they organize. Um, and these laws are, you know, premised on the fact that there's a need to protect family values, there's a need to protect morality. And particularly, we see how these laws, uh, and I'm talking about the anti-homosexuality bill um, in Uganda, 
I'm also talking about the family protection bill in Kenya that, you know, that has just emerged, but also um, tying this to the broader, um, um, you know, practice or exercise or society that we live in. We saw in Rwanda, women, you know, a woman who was arrested because she dressed in a in an immoral way, right? So and it raises questions of law and morality as well. So we see in these laws, um, we see that these laws actually restrict the registration and access to funding for queer organizations, right? So these laws actually say that, um, you know, um, if you register, uh, say, your organization and you're particularly working around queerness and, and you know, LGBTIQ rights, then you know, you've committed a crime. And some of them go so far as to, um, and you know, put the penalty, the death penalty on um, on people who are arrested on these charges. Um, but also these laws, the call for the deregistration of queer organizations as well. And we saw in Uganda, um, the NGO, is it called the NGO board? The, yeah, the NGO board in Uganda actually deregistering, I think, SMAG, SMAG the organization, right? Because if you deregister de this organization, that means it cannot therefore continue its operations because of the continued surveillance, because of the you know, now lack of uh, access to funding. And therefore, this is a space where queer people actually come to access other rights, right? So it means that you limiting this freedom of association has now led to a trickle down effect um, whereby now queer people cannot access other socioeconomic rights as well. Um, we also see um, laws that actually surveil uh, queer organizations. We are seeing um, administrative regulations that call for excessive bureaucratic requirements. You know, so if you want to register an organization that deals with sex work or that, that deals with you know queerness, then now you have to um, you know particularly jump through hoops, jump through administrative hoops to actually get registered uh, in that regard. But I am proud that right now in East Africa, we have a great decision from the Supreme Court in the Eric Guitari case versus the NGO board. Um, that essentially say that only laws can limit rights and only in a justified way. Moral or religious beliefs of a majority cannot be used to deny a minority's rights and therefore allow the um, um, the, the Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission to actually register despite having the words gay and lesbian in its name. <clears throat> Great, so I will also talk about the rise of movements and collectives. So this is another trend that we are seeing um, across East Africa, right? So first of all, I want to acknowledge that um, these, these movements and collectives are organizing or are rising up because um, there's a recognition that nonprofit organizations, as we know them, have sort of morphed into, have sort of morphed into, um, um, you know, operating like the state, operating like the corporations that they are trying to, you know, call out essentially. And so, um, and so we see, you know, this is what is called the nonprofit industrial complex that instead of the nonprofit organizations, as we know them actually fighting against oppression, they have sort of replicated as well, um, those systems of oppression, and within and of themselves, as they even advocate for these fundamental human rights freedoms, they themselves, um, in their, in their, you know, for their workers, for the people that they you know, organize with actually violate those fundamental human rights. And so we see the rise of movements and collectives as an alternative to the depoliticization of nonprofits. So uh, movements and collectives organize um, um, organize, you know, through mutual aid, um, instead of saying getting mainstream funding because they see how mainstream funding can uh, therefore affect their, their autonomy and their, you know, their politics and their ideologies. Um, we see movements and collectives being very unrespectable, right? I think that's the word, unrespectable in a way because they um, therefore bring their politics to the forefront and they feel that um, nonprofits, um, nonprofits as we know them have been depoliticized um, as well. So we see a political choice um, by these movements and collectives to therefore not have a legal personality. Uh, but as we discussed here, let me just go back. As we discussed here, the African Commission Guidelines on Freedom of Association and Assembly in Africa actually allows um, for you know, that associations do not have to be registered. Associations can also be non-registered. They don't have to have a legal um, personality in that regard. So um, yeah, so rise of movements and collectives. 
And I think uh, this is, I uh, don't know if I have time, but yeah, the militarization of COVID-19. So during the, during the pandemic, we saw, particularly in Kenya, and I think Uganda as well, we saw how the police uh, basically, how the state basically used, you know, its powers arbitrarily to, you know, say to, 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 to uh, police people, to limit the freedom of association, to, you know, to adduce police brutality and to give, you know, broaden police power to, you know, to disperse different assemblies. And um, we've also seen that, you know, during the COVID-19 COVID pandemic, that governments in the, uh, governments essentially could not or did not want to invite to the space for conversation um, civil society organizations, trade unions, political parties, particularly, uh, you know, the opposition, um, you know, to the table to actually try to find collective ways of ending the COVID-19. So it was a way that, you know, civil society and other groups were really maligned in trying to, um, uh, in trying to solve the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, yeah. I think this is the last one. So weaponization of defamation laws. So um, we are seeing as well this trend where, um, um, so if as a woman you come out and say that, uh, you know, I was sexually harassed by this person, especially if that person is, you know, uh, you know, and in, you know, someone who is very influential, you'd often get hit with a with a civil defamation suit. And so uh, we we've seen that happening to, you know. Different, different women, particularly we saw in the Shaija Patel versus Tony Mochama case, uh, you know, you know, Shaija Patel say that, you know, this happened to me and got hit with a defamation suit and actually was, you know, the courts demanded that she had to pay, I think, 87,000 USD to, to, to a person who sexually harassed her. So um, we're seeing this trend coming out and, you um, Communications from the Human Rights Council have, you know, stated that, you know, the experiences of survivors of violence are actually a matter of public interest and form part of the freedom of expression. The right to speak about the experiences of violence, harassment and discrimination is integral to the right to live free um, from violence. But also in Uganda, we saw through the Computer Misuse Act of 2011, particularly article, you know, um, um, particularly in subsection 25, um, we saw that you know um, the 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 provision that you know uh, prohibits offensive. Okay, so the, how the act prohibits offensive communication, that particular provision was used to actually target activists such as Dr. Stella Nyanzi and, um, you know, Kakwenza in, in, in Uganda. So in this way as well, we see how um, laws are being weaponized, first of all, to target activists, but also to um, numb or, you know, shrink the voice of survivors of violence that, you know, if you cannot um, therefore report um, your sexual violence, if you cannot articulate, say, on digital platforms how you are sexually harassed, then it would amount to um, defamation in that regard. Um, I'd like to stop there, and I hope that at the end of uh, a presentation from other councils as well, we will therefore be able to explore more, and I would be able to answer some questions, also hear some of your comments around this, but thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Councillor Vivian. I think uh, that was quite insightful. For the benefit of our listeners, uh, Councillor Vivian, I would like you to turn on your video so that they can see who the able discussant has been. There she is. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah this French. is me. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Councillor Vivian. For a brief recap of our Council Vivian's presentation, she has clearly defined the freedom of association, what it entails, and what it means within the context of international law. She has similarly uh, made it clear that the freedom is not absolute. There are limitations provided under international law and municipally under different constitutions of the different member states of East African region. Um, she has also taken us through the tests. What qualifies as acceptable limitation within uh, international law? What courts of law look at to justify particular limitation? And whether that limitation 
situation is justifiable within a democratic dispensation. She has made a case for usage of uh, the digital space in uh, promotion of uh, freedom of association and assembly, and how the same spaces have been used by, by states across the East African region uh, to curtail freedom of association and assembly. She has spoken about uh, criminalization of a certain forms of association. This is not new for countries like Uganda. We already have a legislation that uh, curtails an association of members who uh, practice same-sex relations. She has also talked, uh, talked about uh, the rise of movements and collectives uh, and clearly stated that uh, you no longer have to register to have a legal personality to associate or to have a movement that uh, promotes uh, your beliefs, your opinions as a group. A militarization of a uh, COVID-19 pandemic, it was the uh, first of its kind. We don't know what will happen if you have another pandemic. We saw in Uganda in particular, uh, where uh, force was used to this uh, disperse persons who had gone to pro pro provide foodstuffs to different groups of people who didn't have means under the guise of ensuring public health, as well as using defamation laws to curtail expression of opinions by those in government that are perceived to be anti-establishment. Like uh, what uh, Dr. Walimera earlier said, you cannot talk about freedom of assembly and freedom of association and don't talk about uh, freedom to express one's opinion. They move hand in hand. Once again, thank you, Council Vivian. Let's now move to let's now move to Council Vivian. Uh, sorry, Council William Ernest Devuyo. Uh, Council Vivian has laid a foundation for the discussion and talked about these limitations. When you look at Article. 21 and Article 22 of the ICCPR, there are limitations to the enjoyment of the freedom of assembly and freedom of association. And these clawbacks to enjoyment of these freedoms. What is your take on this? The fact that international law and municipal laws recognize that these rights have to be enjoyed, these freedoms have to be enjoyed by people in, in, in their boundaries. But again, you see uh, legislations passed that curtail the enjoyment of these freedoms. Council Kivuyo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Hubbard. Uh, may, may I start by saying um, uh, freedom of association is uh, is a fundamental uh, right and uh, it is really important uh, to any healthy democracy. Uh, it is something you cannot do without, and especially because of the con connectivity, the symbiotic relationship that you just uh, talked about. Uh, how so do you uh, mind having your video for the benefit of our listeners and viewers? Uh, you want a video? Okay. Uh, could there be some connection issues? And we can see you now. We, we can see you now. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so uh, I believe you don't want it throughout. <laughs> it, it, no problem. I wanted our listeners to be able to know who is talking to them. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, uh, I, I was saying uh, uh, it is a very um, uh, it is a very fundamental right, and uh, but unfortunately, governments around the world and specifically East Africa. Uh, uh, increasingly introducing tightening restrictions on civil on, on freedom of uh, association 
And um, we have seen that in different uh, countries in East Africa. Uh, we've seen it in Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, uh, and other uh, East African uh, partner states, uh, as I will uh, talk uh, at length on, 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 uh, uh, on a few countries. Um, uh, I'll talk uh, about uh, two, uh, two things. One, the ICCPR, and, um, and uh, again, on the municipal uh, laws uh, of the East African uh, partner states. On the ICCPR, uh, yes, uh, Article 22 uh, provides for uh, freedom of uh, association. It guarantees freedom of association. And um, we've seen um, these rights being uh, reflected in the national constitution, constitutions. It is reflected in the constitution of, uh, of Kenya. Uh, it, is, uh, it is reflected in the constitution of uh, Tanzania and other countries. The, the problem uh, is with the legislations, the, 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 the parliament made laws. That is normally where the clawback clauses are, are put. So the constitution uh, guarantees uh, that right, but um, uh, a, particular, uh, a particular law of the parliament uh, comes in and puts uh, restrictions. On, on, on how on, on the enjoyment of those uh, freedoms. Um, you will see, for example, the constitution of Kenya is very clear and audible on that right. Uh, every person has the right freedom of association, uh, which includes the right to, to form, join, participate in activities of association of any kind. Uh, it's any kind. Uh, a person shall not be compelled to join an association of any kind. Um, uh, any legislation that requires registration of an association of any kind shall provide that registration may not be withheld. It, it is loud and clear on, on, on the extent of enjoyment of the, of the freedom of association. The, the problem is with the legislations. And um, uh, these legislations come with uh, clawback uh, clauses, uh, which I will, I, will, I, will, I will talk at length. But um, uh, from the ICCPR as an international uh, document, of course, there are the international documents that touch on freedom of association. Uh, for example, the universal, um, uh, uh, for example, the, 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 the EU Declaration of Human Rights, it also talks about freedom of, freedom of association. And uh, all these international documents seek to create independent, capable, effective, and vibrant organizations in our states. They want to ensure organizations are free from, uh, are free to form and decide on the membership, uh, on the funding, on how they work. They want, uh, these international uh, instruments want to see that um, uh, the policies and practices are affecting association meet international standards. Uh, Unfortunately, when it comes to, to, to national legislations, um, uh, our states uh, do not reflect uh, those, those contents of the international uh, standards. Um, we've seen the trends in East Africa. Um, uh, there are trends of restrictions on organizations working in civil society, including restrictive laws, regulations, practices, and barriers to access to fund, to funding, and there are funding cuts, and also um, in some countries it goes as far as um, freezing the bank accounts. Uh, this, for example, happened in Tanzania uh, to some organizations where their funds were freezed uh, in the banks, and the government took the funds uh, during our fifth uh, government. Now uh, there, there, there's there's that. Um, there's that trend in our national, uh, in our national, uh, in our countries. Um, it is estimated that between 2015 and 2018, um, most all, all, about uh, 72 countries all over the world, including East African partner states, uh, have introduced laws restricting operations of, um, uh, you know, organizations. Um, 
And of course, these, um, these restrictions come along uh, the lines of accessing to funds, the legal status and formation, governance and operations, uh, reporting requirements, on, on access to funding, uh, you, you are, you are, there are restrictions. We will see, for example, with the laws of Tanzania, with the amendments that came in 20, uh, 2019, where you are restricted on, 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 on how uh, to seek funding, and uh, there are so many requirements. Uh, the legal status and formation, um, we have controls. For example, in Tanzania, uh, during the fifth uh, government, um, uh, you could, when someone attempts to register an organization, uh, there are those structures that would require you to be as clear as possible. For example, when you put such a statement as uh, inclusion, then they are, they are told remove, and th there's no space for discussion. Someone is on... Is, is, is in a position of deciding. So it just says, remove this word. We, we don't want to see it, uh, no explanation. And if you don't remove, um, you are not registered. So uh, there are those um, uh, uh, restrictions. Um, governance and operations, um, they, are, they, they go uh, to an extent of, um, uh, you know, wanting to know what exactly you are doing, wanting to know uh, who are you involved with. Uh, if it is someone whom the government is negative about, then uh, uh, you're in trouble and the organization is in trouble. Um, and you know, there are always uh, ways of the government to finding a way of uh, screwing an organization. Uh, and uh, it's difficult to get out of the, their hands. Uh, you, if, uh, if the tax authorities are sent to your office, um, it's normally difficult to find you clean. And um, uh, they, they will, they'll use it as a reason to, to deregister an organization. Um, reporting requirements. Uh, the laws, for example, in Tanzania have been tightened. Uh, it, it just requires a lot, as we will see uh, later. Um, allow me to kind of uh, now talk about municipal legislations. And um, let, me, let me start with Tanzania. Um, uh, let me start with Tanzania where uh, I am based and uh, where I have practical experiences on, on, on these restrictions. Um, the constitution of uh, the United Republic of Tanzania, Article 20, uh, provides for freedom of, of, of association. It provides for freedom uh, of persons to associate. Uh, but like I said in my previous, uh, uh, in my introductory remarks, um, the constitution uh, guarantees those rights. And sometimes it, 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 it is crafted uh, in a manner that resonates with international standards. The problem is the, with, the, is the, with the, the acts of parliament, the legislations. Um, <clears throat> the, these legislations, um, are restrictive, are um, too much restrictive, such that um, it becomes difficult to operate. For example, uh, I'll talk about uh, three uh, legislations. The non one, the Non-Governmental Organizations Act of 2002, revised edition 2019. Uh, uh, this act was, was um, enacted in 2002. And when it was enacted, it was kind of a fair law. It was kind of a law that was drafted in a manner that um, promotes uh, freedom of association, particularly of NGOs. But in 2005, uh, there was a miscellaneous, a miscellaneous amendment that now started to, uh, to put um, some, 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 to shape the, the act. Uh, the 2005 amendments uh, were not too bad. They were kind of fairly clear. I mean, I'm mean, kind of um, fair um, because uh, what, it, what uh, the 2005 uh, amendment did was to put more clarity on the definition of an NGO and um, to introduce, to give NGOs 
the status of a, corporate, a, corporate, a body corporate capable of suing and being sued, uh, capable of acquiring, purchasing, and disposing property. But again, uh, it gave it the, 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 the mandate, the ability to enter into contracts. The problem was from 20, uh, 2018. That when when that is when we 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 um, we really had uh, uh, laws that are restricting uh, freedom of association uh, enacted in 2018 uh, through uh, government notice 609 of 2018. Uh, there was um, a regulation, non-government organizations act amendment regulations that was um, passed by parliament in Tanzania. Um, and under that law, an NGO was obliged to, to, to disclose to the public, to, to the registrar, the council, the board, and the stakeholders within 14 days from the date of completion of fundraising activities to disclose the source of, the source of funds, to disclose um, the expenditure of the funds, and to disclose activities to be carried out from the funds. Uh, maybe that is not too bad. Um, uh, it, it also requires an NGO to be answerable, responsive, and accountable to the people it serves through existing local government structures. Uh, this has uh, put trouble on the NGOs, uh, on the practical, on the field, because uh, back in the days, NGOs used to do, make annual returns to the ministry responsible for NGOs, um, Ministry for Community Development. Um, but now, under this new uh, regulation, uh, the NGOs are being required to be answerable and accountable to the local government uh, authorities, which do not even know how NGOs are operated. So they sometimes uh, pop into NGO offices and uh, they inquire about uh, information about issues that are uh, uh, irrelevant and not, not practical and not uh, supportive in the work of NGOs, and it just becomes chaos. So um, that, that kind of uh, a restriction being put, the, the government wants uh, the monitoring right to the root, right down to the, to the, to the very root of um, where the NGOs are operating, but with those challenges. Um, that particular regulation also did put uh, a, a restriction that any NGO that obtains funding exceeding 20 million shillings, 20 million Tanzania shillings is around, is, um, around about $8,000, $8,000 to $9,000. And it, it requires an NGO with that amount, which, which, which obtains that amount, uh, to, 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 to disclose expenditure and to circulate in a newspaper uh, or other media ch channels um, on, on how uh, that uh, particular amount ex was expended. Uh, this is a very small amount. Now, when you are uh, requiring an NGO to disclose it, uh, well, uh, okay, maybe it is okay, but um, uh, fairly speaking, uh, practically, is, is kind of a, a disturbance. But again, this law requires um, the contracts to be disclosed, to be submitted to the treasury and the registrar, uh, not later than 10 days from the date of entering the said contract or agreement for approval. Uh, this means um, that when a particular NGO enters into contract with, um, with uh, a donor, uh, it has to submit uh, that contract to the registrar within uh, 10 days of entering that contract. Uh, the, 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 for approval, it has to be approved. Now, the problem is um, the contract is being submitted when uh, it has been entered and the government is going to approve. What if it does not uh, approve? If it, is, it, 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 it disapproves it, then uh, an NGO is forced to go back to the donor to say the government doesn't want this, so we cannot go on with the project. That was what it, it entails. So it, it puts a restriction on the part of the on the part of the, the, the NGO. But again, 
uh, in 2019, there was another uh, restriction, another law that was um, made that was uh, uh, made in Tanzania, the Non-Government Organizations Renew and, and Incentives Regulations of 2019. Um, this introduced a requirement for a certificate to be renewed after 10 years. Uh, back in the days, uh, once an NGO is registered, all it does is to do the annual returns and these other administrative uh, uh, compliances. But now, uh, an NGO an NGO certificate is only valid for 10 years. After that, an NGO now with this new law, 2019, it has to renew it. If it doesn't renew, then uh, the organization becomes um, uh, as good as no, 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 non-existing. Um, um, well, that law allows uh, for appeal. If the registrar refuses to register, uh, one can appeal to the minister and then to the high court. But again, that is a, a, a restriction. A, a, a restriction. Um, that was not enough. There was another regulation in the same year, 2019, that was published. Uh, it was called Non-Governmental Organizations' Rights and Duties of Assistant Registrars. Um, this introduced an assistant registrar uh, who is to be appointed by the registrar. And this one now is the one who monitors um, uh, who monitors the NGOs uh, at the lower levels. And it requires that an NGO implementing a project with funding contract um, of the value of Tanzania shillings 20 million, again, about $8,000, uh, uh, should have a letter of approval from the registrar. So uh, those who have been in NGOs, we, we understand that you normally submit uh, a proposal uh, with a timeline showing when are you supposed to start the project, when the project should end. But you cannot start until you have an approval uh, from the registrar. An approval of how much? An approval of about $8,000, such a minimum amount. So it is a restriction because an NGO, uh, an NGO's hands are, are tied up. It cannot operate, it cannot start its uh, projects, implementation of its projects in the time that it, it had scheduled. Uh, but again, this registrar is given investigative duties. It, uh, the registrar can, this assistant registrar can investigate on these uh, NGOs. So uh, those are some of the, uh, the, 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 the trends in Tanzania, uh, especially during the fifth uh, government. Unfortunately, uh, oh, these laws are still there, they're existing, though the sixth government with the, with the current president uh, is kind of um, sorry for these laws. They kind of, though they're not uh, happy to implement them, to administer them, but the problem is they have not been amended they are still there, so they are still operative, even even if the, the current government uh, is not uh, is not um, uh, so much willing to implement them. So, in summary, uh, with Tanzania, uh, Tanzanian NGO laws, um, these am amendments were intended to weaponize non-governmental organizations, um, uh, especially during the fifth government, where we saw the apex of such uh, weaponization. Some NGOs had the executive directors arrested. For example, an NGO called uh, Tawesa, um, its uh, executive director, Mr. Aidan Eyakuze, uh, was arrested and he was ac accused of being a non-citizen. Of course, they could not tell to which country he belongs, but uh, at least they accused, of, they accused him of, uh, of, of not being a Tanzanian and he was arrested only because he was critical, he was... Um, he was strong against the government movements that was not in favor of the people. Uh, but again, registration became difficult. Uh, back in the years, uh, like uh, uh, it was indicated, I have been in the practice for, the, for more than 10 years. It, was, it used to be easy to, to register an NGO when you meet the qualifications. But uh, after these restrictions, it became difficult to register uh, an NGO. There are a lot of conditions and sometimes someone sitting on his, um, on his seat of authority can just uh, twist a certain section of law and 
and and and misuse it uh, to curtail uh, to 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 prevent an angel from being registered. Um, another law that kind of put restrictions on freedom of association in Tanzania is the Societies Act. Uh, uh, the Societies Act is an act uh, which registers uh, societies, uh, uh, and um, most religious organizations are registered under this act. Um, with this one, there have not been so much uh, amendments, but the act in itself is restrictive uh, to freedom of association because it requires, unlike these other laws, unlike the NGOs Act, it requires uh, a lengthy procedure. And sometimes it involves, it requires the, natural, the national security to verify whether that organization is, um, uh, is, uh, is, uh, uh, needs, uh, needs to be registered or, I mean, whether that organization uh, should or should not be registered. So uh, it brings, uh, it becomes cumbersome to, to register. Another act is the Political Parties Act. Uh, this is an act that provides for conditions and procedure for registration of political parties. Uh, but again, during 2018, 2019, there were so many restrictions on political parties. Uh, you might be aware that um, uh, Tanzania went to an, the government of Tanzania went to an extent an extent of um, uh, banning other uh, all political parties uh, from running their political rallies from assembly. There's, there was no freedom of assembly in Tanzania for for about six about six years. Uh, political parties could not assemble. Uh, anywhere. And this was just uh, a decree of the president. There was no law on that, but the president decreed. And uh, for about six years, political parties could not hold any meetings, be it in the open space, be it in the, in, in, in the buildings. Uh, the moment they are there, even for the administrative meetings, the police are there uh, telling them you have no um, you have not been allowed to undertake this meeting. You should have informed the police for you to get authorization, and the meeting gets closed. So it was um, uh, it was uh, six years of uh, really agony uh, and 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 um, and, uh, and, uh, and a serious uh, damage on political parties uh, because they could not hold even their internal meetings. Um, another law was um, another law. Um, uh, on that, uh, yeah, those are the laws I want to talk about uh, in relation to, to Tanzania. Um, now, uh, just a kind of uh, wrapping up about Tanzania, uh, these restrictions are also uh, geared toward advocacy. Uh, on advocacy, there are those restrictions as well. And um, again, the, those restrictions come again around Counterterrorism and uh, money laundering issues. Uh, the, 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 the government comes uh, around uh, money laundering and counterterrorism to also restrict some, uh, to bring some restrictions. Um, public interest uh, litigation. Um, there are some organizations that have uh, had difficulties because they have undertaken public interest litigation. Um, and for example, in Tanzania, uh, you might, you guys might be aware of the Ngorongoro, what is going on in Ngorongoro. There are people who are being, um, uh, being, uh, taken out of the Ngorongoro, uh, Ngorongoro conservation area to another area in a different part of the country called Tanga. And, um, civil society organizations tried to come up and, uh, defend the rights of these people. And these people were, sought after, uh, especially because they have taken, uh, they have filed public interest litigations in the High Court of Tanzania and in the East African, uh, in East African Court of Justice. Um, some, in the, some people from these organizations had to go hiding because uh, they, they could no longer be sure of their security. So uh, uh, even when these organizations attempt to uh, kind of uh, defend the rights of the people through 
a legal procedure such as approaching a court of law, still they will be hunted, uh, their families will be threatened, and they, they go hiding. Thank God they did not stop. Uh, these cases on public interest litigation are also going on, and I'm thankful for East Africa Society because they're also supporting uh, those movements, and um, they've been um, useful in, the, in, those, uh, in supporting NGOs in Tanzania on those uh, movements. That takes me to a short discussion about Kenya. Um, like uh, I highlighted earlier on, the constitution of Kenya is clear and guarantees freedom of association in very clear terms. Um, again, the statute is a problem. The Angels Act of Kenya uh, is, is, is what brings um, a challenge. So the constitution of Kenya, uh, it can fairly be said it is up to the international standard, but the legislation. And um, with Kenya, um, different from Tanzania, um, when these bills, when these laws were being, when these uh, bills were being taken to parliament, uh, the, 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 the NGOs and the people of Kenya were able to resist and some of these restrictive clauses will not go into, into the laws. So different from Tanzania, uh, where the government was successful in, in, in putting these sections uh, on, on these restrictive sections on, on, on law through the parliament, uh, Kenya is, is slightly different that uh, uh, they managed to, uh, to resist the putting of these restrictive clauses, restrictive sections. On, on, on laws on parliament. But again, um, you, can talk about, you, cannot, you cannot talk about uh, freedom of association, freedom of assembly in Kenya without um, uh, touching on the elections, the national elections in Kenya, uh, which have been um, uh, uh, very political and uh, involved uh, instances of, um, uh, of uh, uh, laws of public order. Uh, we remember the 2007 elections during Kibaki and uh, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the opponents. Um, there was uh, a lot of uh, bloodshed, and this all this came around uh, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, freedom of expression. We have seen police in Kenya brutally uh, beating up people, brutally killing people during those elections, uh, and people were really uh, went through difficulties. Um, we remember that the Uhuru, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta and uh, the, 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 the incumbent president were taken to the, uh, to the ICC, um, yes, International Criminal you. Court. Yes. Uh, there's a grammar from our participants to have your video on. Maybe you can turn it on in the next two minutes as you wind up. Uh, thank you. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I am seen. Yes. So um, I was talking about uh, Kenya. Um, that um, you cannot talk about freedom of association in Kenya without talking about the elections, where normally uh, it is monumental. And um, again, another country that I. Uh, I would like to talk shortly about is uh, South Sudan. Uh, the Angels Act of South Sudan uh, is, um, is, an, is an act that uh, provides for uh, the regulation of uh, NGOs. Uh, but when you look at it, um, the substantive clauses, uh, it is, its objectives are more toward into, uh, it, it kind of uh, addresses the current situation, the current war situation in South Sudan not necessarily uh, uh, the, 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 the operations and the, 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 the existence of, of, of NGOs. Um, um, if I may wind up, uh, I, would, uh, I would say uh, um, freedom of association is such a fundamental uh, uh, right that, uh, that is essential in any democratic uh, society. So uh, this East African um, part, East African uh, countries uh, need to uh, to 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 reform the laws to reflect 
the international standards and to comply with their national constitutions. Uh, thank you. May end up uh, there for, for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Kivuyo. I think uh, you, you, you make a case for uh, the need to open up more for the NGOs to be able to uh, help uh, different persons, different groups to enjoy the freedom of association and the right to assembly. You have clearly elaborated on the a number of uh, bottlenecks which have been legislatively created by the different Af East African governments uh, in the formation and management of uh, NGOs as curtailing the enjoyment of freedom of association and the right of assembly. Now to you, Council Christine Nkonge. The freedom of association and uh, the right to assemble ensure that there's protection of the ability of East Africans to exercise individual autonomy in solidarity with others. These freedoms and other related rights create the very foundation for a participatory system of governance based on democracy, rule of law, and pluralism. So we as lawyers, we can't just sit back and watch. What can we tell our people, the East Africans, to do to ensure that the space to enjoy these rights, which are key for democracy to, to prevail, I enjoy it. Uh, Council Christine Nkonge in the next 10 minutes, what are your views on what can be done by East Africans to curtail the shrinking space for enjoyment of these rights. Okay, uh, thank you, Herbert. I'll try very quickly in the 10 minutes to be able to speak to the question you posed to me. Mm, I know just as a recap, because I'm a lawyer practicing in Kenya, I'll just highlight some of the things that Council Kivuyo and uh, Council Vivian talked about. And basically, um, it's interestingly because right now I am a member of an association, a professional association, that is the Law Society of Kenya, and, and I'm sure it, as well the East African Law Society is an association of legal professionals that is bringing us here today to speak on to this right, the right to association. And so um, my ability to practice on a day to day um, and to work uh, with other councils on a day-to-day -day is impacted on the ability of Kenya to recognize, promote, and ensure the scope and content of the right to association in Kenya is respected. And likewise, that should go, uh, should be the similar issue in East African society and East African region generally. As uh, Council Kivuyo and Council Vivian have noted, the constitution of Kenya says that you have the right to association uh, of any kind. And you, Herbert, has also articulated that it can be for political, economic, and social purposes. So here we are um, exercising the right to association for a professional purpose, um, and maybe with political aims, because we are looking at how to promote the right to democracy in Kenya and East Africa. Uh, the right to association in Kenya has been noted in the constitution that when registration is required, it should, not, it should be reasonable, and it should not be withheld um, and unless there are reasonable grounds to do so, and you must afford a fair hearing before withholding or canceling um, registration. Uh, on that basis, as have been indicated by the councils that spoke before me, there have been instances during political times or uh, periods of electioneering in Kenya, whereby we've had civil societies offices impromptly and um, without any cause you've come in the morning and then you've just to find that your office has been shut down by the security um, personnel without being afforded that right to um you know for fair hearing uh, before that is done and almost always in kenya these kind of actions are very they become more noticeable and more prevalent during electioneering periods and also during instances of um 
uh, insecurity, especially terrorism and extremism, you'll find that civil society organizations documenting extrajudicial killings, working towards countering violent extremism, will find themselves either A, their accounts, um, their bank accounts have been closed unceremoniously uh, without notice, without justification, or two, they are actually prevented from carrying out their work, um, either by denial registration or cancelling of registration on the basis they have not complied on reporting uh, standards under the Non-Governmental uh, Coordinations Act. Um, so again, all these are hallmarks of instances as uh, Kenya and Af uh, East Africa we are facing in terms of ensuring rule of law prevails. The letter of the law, the spirit of the law um, should prevail and it's for our purpose. And that purpose is to entrench democracy and to consolidate democratic greens in our region. So I, the councils here and the other cases which I will just mention so you can look at them because um, I, uh, I don't have enough time. We can go and look at the case of Attorney General versus Randuzawi Rua. Uh, you can also look at the case of Eric Gitari versus Non Governmental Organization Coordination Board. You can look at the case of Avis in Kenya versus Registrar Societies. You can look at the case of Muhuri uh, versus the Inspector General of Police. All these are cases giving different aspects of the right to association. One is on the right of doctors, for example, a case here uh, on uh, a case here on um, it's PIDA and others uh, versus the Attorney General is the right to, of doctors to associate to get scientific information around the right to abortion. Uh, the Muhuri case is on closure of uh, bank accounts and being labeled spe specified identities in Kenya. So basically, you become associated with terrorism which has international dynamics, because once you are labeled a specified entity, you are entered into a list of a prescribed association in the United, um, under the United Nations. And it really means you become tagged as an extremist or terrorist organization globally. So that is a terrible association to be, uh, to have when you are legitimately carrying out issue, uh, activities to promote democracy in the country. Um, and in Africa generally, and the rest around more generally on the issues of the right to association. So my fellow colleagues and councils here have mentioned some of the things that we can do as lawyers to ensure that we continue. That's what Christian in Right. Uh, thank you for the insight so far. What do you think East Africans as a general without any inclination towards a particular profession can do? Okay. Whether you're a farmer, whether you are a doctor, what yeah. can we do differently to widen the space? Okay, so what once uh, internal vigilance, uh, as we say here for civil society uh, organizations working around from implementation is the of implementation of the constitution is this. You need to ensure that you have vigilance in relation to any laws being passed in parliament. You need to um, take advantage of the clauses you have in your different countries that talk about public participation, giving comments, giving petitions in relation to any law proposed laws that are coming in, trying to close down the space for civic association. So engage in legislative um, processes to the extent that you can. Two, give petitions to your members of parliament and representatives whenever those laws are in place, so that those members, um, those members of the legislature, can promote and um, articulate and amplify your voices. So petitions to relevant government institutions. Three. We should also access, use public interest in litigation to the extent that it's available in your different countries to push back on clawing, uh, uh, on clawing back of progressive laws and to strike, the, and to strike down the progressive laws and non-progressive laws where they exist. Um, so public interest litigation should be used either in your own countries or even we try at the East African Accord of Justice. And number four, in Kenya, we really believe in the right to protest, no matter how difficult it is. Um, they, we, there is always, um, here in Kenya, we always say that politicians react to numbers. 
So whenever there's a visible constituency of people pushing back against an idea, whether it's a law, a policy, then that discussion spills over to the political space where it can be negotiated, discussed, and a solution found. Again, it engages the media who again are able to amplify those voices and to push back and, and, and to even inform more people um, about this kind of retrogressive laws. So therefore, I also find it very necessary that people don't work in silos. People always need to work in solidarity with others, whether you are a doctor's professional association, lawyer's professional association, or farmers or pastoralists. There are some issues if they are clamped down on, they affect us all. So all these associations should be coming together to support each other in solidarity and to provide security to the activists who are on the forefront fighting for these issues, like the issue that was mentioned <laughs> about the Maasai Mara issue in, in Tanzania. Those people needed solidarity. So whenever a group is being victimized, intimidated, oppressed because they are trying to um, exercise their right to association, other associations like Law Society of Kenya, East Africa Law Society need to issue statements in solidarity because those that kind of support helps people on the front line. The third one is to advocate for adoption of progressive laws at, and, and these are the international stage. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the necessary treaties, conventions that a country should adopt to deepen and promote the right to association in their own country we should fight for their adoption and, it, and um, implementation at the local level. And the last one is knowledge is power. So people need to be educated on why the right to association is important. As we've noted here, it affects all your other rights, your political rights, your rights to health, your rights to labor rights, um, fair pay, anything in which you need a critical mass of people to come in and support an idea needs the right to association. So educating our people that you should not just let lawyers and activists be termed as lawyers and activists on a single issue, it is wider than that. So let's continue to be to uh, deepen the knowledge of our communities on the importance of the right to association. I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you, Kanthong Kwonge, for that able presentation. Despite having a very limited time, I believe your points have been very clear and understandable. Uh, equipping East Africans with the knowledge on these rights and freedoms is very important if they are to protect the spaces where they enjoy these freedoms. Uh, and finally, but not least, Dr. Wariamela, having you speak last uh, was by design and by default. You have had colleagues able to take her through freedom of association and assembly, the limitations provided internationally and municipally, uh, the new trends within East African patterns, for enjoyment and curtailing the enjoyment of these freedoms have been clearly elaborated. Now, as a communion of attorneys across the East African divide, what can we do individually or collectively to ensure that these freedoms, which are very key to the rule of law, are respected by home governments and by regional government and are protected, and that East Africans are free to associate and assemble as envisaged under international law. Doctor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, the difficulty of speaking uh, about one topic after all these uh, highly learned people have spoken uh, is quite challenging, although I'm going to uh, try to uh, skip whatever it is they have said, so that's not repetitive. Uh, I, I thought I should say a few things about what they have said, and I'll uh, quickly go to those. I have also prepared a PowerPoint presentation. However, in view of the timelines, um, I think the organizers, I'll send it over to the organizers who can then share it with, uh, uh, with colleagues here. 
Okay, so just a few things about what colleagues have discussed. Uh, before I go to that, uh, perhaps we should start with the fundamental principles and uh, that the uh, African Commission in 2017 laid down on interpreting uh, these freedoms, the freedom of association and assembly, uh, uh, the obtain of them. I will not dwell much on them because of the time that I have, it's so little, but you, uh, once I send my presentation, you see them there and I've, I've indicated clearly the source. So if you want more detail, you can go to the source. Uh, one is that in the interpretation of the right to freedom of association and assembly, uh, presumption is in the favor of these rights. The presumption shall be in favor of the exercise of the rights to freedom of association and assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the enabling framework. Uh, that the enabling framework that is put in place in all our countries enables the exercise of these rights, uh, which is the primary purpose and not necessarily the prohibition or, 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 or the violation of these rights. Three, uh, political and social participation of an independent civil society. An independent civil society is very key uh, to the exercise of these rights. Four, human rights compliance. We see that the compliance with the constitutional, legislative, administrative, and other measures, which are uh, international, regional, sub-regional, then enables the enjoyment uh, of these rights, guarantees the enjoyment of these rights. Impartiality of governance agencies. Uh, many of our colleagues have been discussing about, uh, for example, the colleague uh, Council Kivuya from Tanzania has been discussing uh, how uh, 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 government agencies are, are getting a little excuse not to suggest their organization. So government organizations are supposed to be impartial in the conduct of for example, uh, like Council TV has been mentioning, the registration of an NGO in uh, Tanzania. Simple, transparent procedures, still Council TV has been telling you, and I think uh, other colleagues, uh, in regard to the cumbersome procedures of registering an association. And, and the African Commission is telling uh, these countries that are member states of the African Union that the procedures of registering an association should be simple and transparent. Uh, for Uganda, obviously, I can assure you that they are not Tanzania, we have had they are not uh, Kenya, we have had uh, they are not. So we're clearly falling short. Limited sanctions that, in case they were to be sanctions, those sanctions have to be employed sparingly. Reason decisions, judicial review that decisions shall be clearly and transparently laid out. Uh, with any adverse decisions against, against the enjoyment of the freedoms uh, being given clear written arguments or reasons on the basis of the law, and that there are uh, uh, there are there are provisions for appeal of those decisions uh, uh, in, in in higher uh, uh, platforms. The right to remedy uh, the African Union has a whole instrument on this. Uh, that if uh, the association is wrong, then it has a duty, it has a right to uh, enjoy the remedies that have been granted to it. Uh, more protection, protective standard, that if there is a conflict between uh, the international standards and the national standard, the international standards, uh, regional standards, uh, uh, sub-regional standards in the case of East Africa should be upheld. Uh, sorry for taking your time, but I thought those 10 principles that are very key that the African Commission came up with, in the protection, the interpretation of this right uh, should have been, uh, uh, should be uh, 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 um, laid out. Then uh, my colleague, uh, Kanso Owuya, I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, discuss the aspect of informal associations. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you see in many of our jurisdictions, there's a requirement that if you're going to associate, you ought to be uh, uh, a formal association 
with a formal constitution. And, and, and the African Commission saying, no, 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 no. Both formal institutions, formal associations and informal associations are recognized as long as the informal associations uh, have some form of structure, there is no prohibition that should be laid out by the national legal framework prohibiting such an informal association. Uh, those persons have a right to associate as individuals or as associations. I will not discuss the normative framework. Uh, many of my, my colleagues have discussed that, but perhaps I should touch what, where that normative framework, framework uh, uh, sits. Where that normative framework sits is a place called civic space. And, and scholars have defined what civic space is. Uh, one has indicated that it's the layer between the state business and family in which citizens organize to get an act. Another scholar has indicated that, that that civic space is described as entailing a political, legal, social, economic environment that not only, not only enables, but encourages citizens to exercise their rights, access information, voice their views, organize, engage, and most importantly, meaningfully engage uh, their world. So this, this, this uh, rights that we've been speaking about, the free speech, association, assembly, uh, operate in that space that those scholars are defining as a uh, civic uh, space. So what happens if that, these rights are allowed then the right to free speech, association to assembly, you then have a plurality of voices in that civic space and consequently, if people are being heard, and if these plural voices are being heard from their sections, from their categories, uh, from their lived experiences, then you ultimately will have people listening who are governing the society. And consequently, there will be a sustainable and a democratic uh, society. Now, if you, in a country like uh, we are in many of our countries on the East Africa in the East African region. If you are in a country uh, that is shrinking that civic space, then oftentimes you're going to see the silencing of voices of engaged citizens, citizens, uh, the silencing of civil society actors, and obviously the silencing of those plural voices uh, then may lead to not only a social uh, economic, uh, but also a political instability in uh, that society. Obviously, we have had challenges in the, in the East African uh, region here. Uh, we have had challenges with political instability. We have had challenges with economic stability in many of our East African countries. We have so Burundi, what happened there. Uh, uh, if you look closely, you may see that the civic space uh, where these rights that we're discussing operate had been shrunk. And consequently, people had no way to discuss their issues and they had to go to the bush and that uh, all had to carry out a coup and that created a lot of challenges there. And that's just uh, one uh, example. Then the other key issue that I would like to mention about civic space is that this civic space in which these rights, the three rights operate is, is not fixed. It shrinks and expands depending on what the engaged citizens have cultivated. And the lawyers are very key in either shrinking this space or expanding it. And if you have in a country where lawyers are quiet, where lawyers are not engaging in public interest litigation, where lawyers are not speaking up, where lawyers are not uh, uh, talking to other civil society actors, you're going to have this specific space in which these rights are discussing uh, being shrunk. If you're in a country where the lawyers are speaking up, where the citizens are speaking up, where the workers are speaking up, where the doctors are speaking up, where everybody's speaking up, you're going to have this civic space expanded. And, 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 and consequently, the rights uh, will be enjoyed. Uh, obviously, there are, uh, my colleagues have mentioned uh, the reasons for the shrinking of the civic space, but globally, obviously, which also affects East Africa, is that we see countries like the US moving, um, uh, carrying out a more uh, inward uh, foreign policy. We see China's development as a superpower affecting how this civic space. 
we see counterterrorism affecting this space. Uh, we see uh, the development of IT, information and media technology, also affecting this space uh, because uh, the governments have realized that once you restrict the physical spaces, uh, people will go onto the online spaces. And those online spaces then protect uh, the physical spaces. And, and we're, we're seeing that increasingly governments are thinking of now entering those online spaces and also shrinking those two. In Uganda here, we've had a couple of people who are launching uh, 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 books, launching videos, launching investigative reports online, and the police comes up and says, you do not have the right to launch that report online. So uh, what can we do? Uh, 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 obviously, before I go to what can we do, obviously COVID also in some sense has affected uh, uh, this civic space in which these rights operate. Uh, so what can we, uh, before I say, if I go to what we can we do, uh, my colleagues also mentioned a bit uh, in regard to what uh, the reasons that the, the government uses to restrict uh, uh, this, uh, these rights. Uh, obviously, national security is ranks very high there. Those who are, who are interested have written a paper on this. Uh, there's there's a, an instrument uh, 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 that restricts a government arguing that it is restricting your enjoyment of rights, basic fundamental human rights based on national security. Mm -hmm. yeah. The three page uh, journal article, you can read it and see what the extent of restriction of based on national security is. Uh, others will urge national sovereignty that uh, foreigners are interfering with, uh, with their running of the country, counterterrorism, money laundering. We have had NGOs all over the East African region uh, being, uh, 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 their bank accounts being freezed on the basis that they are either into money laundering or they're into counterterrorism or they are working with foreigners and therefore they are uh, uh, enemies of the state. So what do they, these governments, what are they doing to, uh, to uh, on, based on those reasons, what are they doing? First, they are passing restrictive laws in parliament. Uh, our colleague from Tanzania has mentioned uh, them. I'm not going to those. But then secondly, and most importantly, they are ostracizing citizens who are engaged in attempting to expand these civic spaces. If you go into all these countries, you're going to see that citizens who are engaged in expanding the civic space in which these rights uh, to free speech association and assembly should be practiced are being, uh, 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 being harassed. And not only them being harassed, but their families are also being harassed. Not only their families being harassed, the organizations that they work for are being harassed. And consequently, if you see, if you're a member of the civil society organization, if you're an engaged citizen in your society, and you see one of your colleagues being harassed, that has a chilling effect on how you then act uh, in the future. And the government security services, the government intelligence services are aware of this chilling effect. Uh, if they discipline one individual and close uh, the offices of one NGO, if they kill a security guard uh, who is guarding your information at one office of the NGO, some of you or many of you will, will cow back and uh, you get into self-censorship and that has a chilling effect on the rest of the civil society actors, which consequently freezes or shrinks that civic space in which you should exercise uh, this rights free speech, association, and assembly. So what, what should we as lawyers do? What should we do as lawyers? Did I hear you say something? OK. What should we, okay. What should we as lawyers do uh, in regard to, to fighting for this space, the, the space that those scholars have defined in which we operate, in which we enjoy these rights uh, uh, to free speech, association and assembly. One, one of the ways, as I've told you, is the government's use uh, uh, laws, restrictive laws, uh, and, and we have an opportunity as lawyers, as law societies, 
that during the readings of these bills uh, at the second reading at committee stage i don't know what it's called in other countries but here it's at the committee stage and it's called the second reading the lawyers individual lawyers can go and approach uh, uh, these committees who are scrutinizing these bills that are intended to restrict this civic space and they'll give their opinions the law societies are often especially for the uganda law society it's often invited uh, to give their views uh, on uh, bills that are before these committees i am not sure that many of our colleagues all over the east african uh, 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 region are you effectively utilizing uh, this 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 opportunity because you find that for example in uganda here they passed a law uh, on taxation of lawyers and the lawyers eventually realized that they had become a law later on and was affecting them and they had to run back to court to ensure that the lawyers were not being taxed in accordance with that uh, law however this law had been presented to the law society uh, had been distributed to the law society membership and none of the members uh, uh, thought to go to this uh, 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 committee stage uh, of, of the parliament to explain to them some of the basic most basic uh, reasons of the law and 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 obviously it came to bite uh, members of the law society here so so this is a very key important opportunity for lawyers within east africa to utilize uh, when you see that bills are being uh, uh, scrutinized at committee stage please approach talk to the clerk of that committee approach the 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 the, the the committee, they will give you a time slot. You'll be able to discuss uh, 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 your views in regard to these uh, uh, bills that may be restricted to these rights that we're discussing. Uh, most importantly, these bills that I'm talking about that restrict this civic space, that shrink the civic space, are usually drafted in vague and overly broad provisions. Uh, the vagueness and imprecision is intended to then enable the enforcers to use the political uh, lens uh, to enforce that law. Uh, and there are many laws, if you look at uh, laws uh, on corruption, some people are, are being taken on, some people who are still a lot more are not being taken on. If you look at those who are violated with these rights, the very rights we're discussing, some people are left alone, some people are taken on and shown as examples. So the, the, the vagueness with which these laws are drafted, and by the way, interesting, it's the lawyers who are drafting these very broad and overly uh, uh, vague provisions are then used uh, to then enforce those laws because, because since they are imprecise, you can't say it says this against something else. The, the way the politician wants to interpret it, for political motives, you interpret it that way. So one of the ways lawyers can contribute is to ensure that whenever these bills are being brought up that attempt to shrink the civic space uh, in which we exercise these three rights, uh, free, free speech, association, and assembly, we should be there at the committee stage uh, to make some noise to say whatever it is you're passing is wrong because uh, it violates uh, these rights and those rights then enable uh, a free and democratic uh, uh, society. So you have a very, very big role there to play. Then uh, my sister, uh, uh, Council Weir, discussed about the necessity and proportionality test. Uh, it's, it's commonly known as the, as the three-part test, uh, or the OX test. It's from, from a Canadian case, uh, Republic versus OX. I'll, I'll send you this uh, presentation and look at it. But, but it, it, it gives three tests that you should, uh, uh, if, if, if these rights, if the right to free speech, the right to association, the right to assembly is going to be justifiably legally restricted, uh, it must pass the three part test. And what is the three part test in simple terms? A, that that justifiable limitation has a legal basis. Two, that that justifiable limitation is pursuing a legitimate aim. Three, that that justifiable limitation 
is necessary in a free and democratic society. If you look at Article 19.3 of the ICCP Act and many of our uh, regional sub-regional documents, uh, even national constitutions, uh, you'll see that that right in some sense is reflected in the national constitutions in some of the East African countries, it's broadly reflected. In some of the countries, it is specifically reflected. For example, in Uganda here, Article 43 uh, broadly reflects this restriction. Uh, so, so in, in regard to what my colleague, uh, the proportionality and necessity test she talked about, you can also uh, take time to read up on the three-part test or the OPS test uh, uh, in regard to justifiable uh, limitations, the enjoyment of these basic rights. By the way, this three-part test also applies to all the other human rights, uh, basic human rights. Uh, just to uh, conclude, uh, my, my sister Nkonge discussed many of these aspects, uh, the other aspects that the lawyers and law societies can do uh, to expand uh, the civic space in which we exercise these rights. Uh, uh, I'll not discuss those that she has discussed, but perhaps I'll just portray a few that she discussed, and maybe uh, uh, those that she did not discuss, I'll, 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 I'll also discuss that. So, so the key, one of the others that I would like to buttress is uh, what my sister Nkonge discussed is, 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 you know, lawyers usually want to only work with themselves. Uh, but I would like to emphasize, and my sister Nkonge emphasizes this, is that we should act, work with other people. For example, now I'm discussing the aspect of bills in parliament. Uh, the law societies, the lawyers should work very, very closely uh, with the parliament. Uh, with the leaders of these committees, parliamentary committees, establish informal relationships so that when these bills are brought and the bills are intended to shrink the civic, civic space, some of these uh, people can be approached informally and you have a discussion uh, on where this is leading your country to. Uh, obviously, it's leading it to economic, social, and political instability, and nobody wants to stay in a country uh, that is confused. Nobody wants to stay in Libya or Somalia, or, or everybody wants to stay in a place that's organized. So, so informally, you can, you can approach MPs. There are many other actors beyond lawyers, beyond MPs. You can approach lawyer, uh, doctors, you can approach uh, drivers, normal people not, who are not very alike. You can approach drivers, a driver's association. Uh, you can approach a porter's association and in a simplistic manner explain to them uh, what uh, the, the, the challenge is and where we're headed as a country if a particular law is passed or if a particular policy is, is followed, which then is going to create mayhem for everybody. It's going to be instability. People will be fleeing. Uh, South Sudan, you can see people are fleeing all over. Uh, people are suffering and nobody wants to stay in, in such a society uh, because you simply shouldn't allow people to have a civic space in which they can explain to you their grievances. Uh, applications for human rights, these are obvious. The lawyers, Mrs. Olovia lawyers, you know this. Uh, but just to emphasize that the manner in which you do these applications uh, is also important. And, and uh, uh, the ELSC has organized uh, strategic interest litigation capacity workshops. And colleagues, some of you should get into those so that you learn how to do some of these uh, applications for human rights enforcement. Uh, things like private prosecutions uh, are very, very important to deal with individual uh, overzealous officers uh, who are violating uh, these uh, freedoms that we're discussing. Then periodic uh, capacity building sessions like these ones are very important, not only for the lawyers, but for, for the other civil society actors uh, who uh, are there to expand this, this civic space that I was discussing, which environment uh, is, is where we, we, we then exercise uh, 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 this, this right. I've already discussed the aspect of lawyers establishing links with other uh, civil society actors, other networks uh, who are not uh, lawyers. And by the way, this is not just within uh, the, nas the nation, but also in uh, sub regionally, uh, regionally, even internationally. And, and now with the information technology, 
you you don't have to all the time hop on a plane to, to do this networking you, you can do it uh, 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 with the use of technology like we're doing now uh, uh, obviously litigation at sub regional regional and international levels is very important very very important where the national uh, court system has been co-opted as a political tool to sustain the political power of those who are in power. Uh, because many of these dictatorial regimes, uh, when they see that you are now skipping the domestic court because they have been filled with cadres, cadre judges, cadre magistrates, uh, 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 and you go to the sub-regional, regional, international levels, uh, they get, get embarrassed. And in some sense, that restricts uh, their further shrinking of the civic space. Uh, which then gives you breathing space uh, to say a few things, to exercise uh, those uh, freedoms. By the way, just to give an example of Kenya, the Kenyan uh, judiciary was overhauled uh, uh, because during the Moi regime, because uh, 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 some many of the uh, Kenyan lawyers refused not to go to court. They continued to go to court because many of the lawyers discuss with these things. They say, now we are going to court, we are obviously going to find a CADA judge who will then issue uh, uh, an important judgment uh, that, is, that is for the status quo. But the advantage with that is that it leaves a record of that specific judge and his or her interest in judgment on the record. It's there. And once uh, the system flips, uh, you're then able to uh, root out uh, these interesting characters from the court system. So, so it, 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 it may look like a disadvantage in the short term, but in the long term, it's an advantage because then you have proof and evidence that this, this judge is not uh, up to speed with his duties or her duties. And once the system changes, the political system changes, uh, they ought to leave that office because they, 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 they are not fit, a fit person to be uh, in that office. Uh, my mm -hmm. colleagues also discussed. Hello? Yes, I'm winding Dr. up. I'm yeah, winding okay. up. Yes, I'm winding up. So my colleagues also discussed about the aspect of uh, harassment and intimidation of civil society actors. And, and we've seen this even in uh, in many of our places. My Tanzanian colleague talked of this man was was uh, trying to be made stateless. And then there are many other, by the way, apart from that one, there are many others uh, during the, the previous uh, month fully uh, 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 regime that just disappeared eh? and and uh, they were not put in. Uh, there, are, there are many many uh, things many harassments are gone but the key issue here is in establishing the security of these old for society actors and individual engaged in, in engaged individuals uh, is in networking networking the more people you, you are in advocating for an issue the more security you have, the more likelihood that an intelligence security failure won't turn up with you because you very many people you make lots of noise. You have networks beyond the national jurisdiction uh, where these people have power. You, there are people who are going to say a few things for you on your behalf in Kenya. That people will say a few things on your behalf in South Africa. That people will say a few things on your behalf if you're being harassed in, in New York. And, and, and the government will have to listen because it, uh, they, they have, they have they, they, although they are big here nationally, they have good fathers elsewhere that they have to answer to. And we see some of these activities, they include deregistration of the civil society organization. Uh, obviously, the, what our Tanzanian colleague mentioned, make new stateless. Uh, they include arbitrary office shutdowns, breakings, vandalization, the freezing of bank accounts. This is especially during before, before, during, and after elections. You see many civil society organizations, uh, bank accounts being freezed on flimsy reasons, and they are supporting terrorism, uh, they, they, are, they are supporting foreigners, blah, blah, blah. Blackmailing of civil society actors. So if you're a very uh, 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 well-known civil society actors, they will use uh, these tabloids to say a few things about you and a few of your uh, individual weaknesses and, and make them pronounced in public uh, to make you cow down. Diligentization and criminalization of official and genuine civil society activities. You've seen the murder 
of civil society actors uh, in Uganda here we've had many of those, uh, including uh, the, the security people who keep these civil society offices uh, being shorted and no investigation or, or, or some semblance of an investigation being done, which yields uh, nothing. Very, very important is the engagement of the diplomatic community. We have individual lawyers here who represent these embassies, who have influenced those embassies. And when they go to informally to those embassies and sit down the ambassador or the first secretary or second secretary and discuss some of these aspects, uh, these people have a lot of power against these so-called big leaders here. Uh, they, they will definitely uh, reduce the speed at which they are reducing our civic space. Uh, so in video influential lawyers who have contacts, informal contacts, formal contacts with the diplomatic community can use those. Our own law societies have these contacts with the diplomatic community. Uh, these leaders, once an ambassador sits them down, uh, once they sit, an ambassador sits down, a president of your country who you see uh, issuing all sorts of interesting orders publicly, they'll, 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 they'll cow down. So this engagement with the informal engagement with the diplomatic community, whether by individual lawyers or by the law societies, the leaders themselves, is very important in expanding, maintaining uh, the civic space in which, which these three rights will operate. Lawyers have been trained in formalism. Eh? We like a lot of formalism. But informal engagements are very, very, very important uh, in resolving these issues. That's why I was saying that colleagues who are on the call who have not done public interest litigation should do so. Sometimes you file a case in the court, a public interest litigation case, and you do not intend to win it. You simply intend to cause a debate around the issue. And, and you can only go get those tactics uh, uh, if, if you have some training in public interest litigation, which the ELS is happily, um, I'm happy is giving. And these informal engagements I am indicating are also very important uh, because you have people you know, I've given the example of the embassies, you have people you know uh, who are influential, who are special rapporteurs, who are at regional level, who are at sub-regional level, who have influence over these people who are shrinking our civic space and you can uh, speak to them and they'll be able to listen. I'll just give you an example. In 2009, uh, we went to Ghana uh, as political leaders. And Ghana is where it is politically uh, that one, the ruling party will come and an opposition party takes over and there's no even one plate shot. Uh, they, there have been transitions from the opposition to the ruling. That was enabled partly by informal engagements. Uh, they had a, 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 a prime minister who Jerry Lawrence would make prime, appoint prime minister all the time was called P.V. Obeng, he died uh, seven or eight years ago. And he would go in the night and approach some of these very hard, hard people and engage them formally. He says, this Ghana is ours, this Ghana is ours. And eventually they began to accuse him of being a mole of, of one of the sides, but he continued with his efforts. He recruited other people and eventually Ghana is where it is now. Nobody sees the other as an enemy. Uh, these specs that they have, they have a presidential transition act. If one government leaves, the next government comes in, you have certain specs. If you're at a certain level, you can use the VIP launch. Those are the little, little, some of the little things that then cause a lot of wars where people do not want to be power. But some of those Ghana has resolved because of the value of informal engagement. So lawyers, please, 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 I know you like formalism, and that's the manner of your training. But informal engagements are also very, very important in protecting this civic space in which uh, we can operate, in which we can enjoy uh, these uh, three rights uh, that are discussed, uh, free speech, association, and assembly. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. Uh, that's it. I'm sorry, I've taken slightly more time if I had been done the, the PowerPoint, I would, even, I would even have been worse. But thank you very much for listening to me. So, thank you, Doctor, for the help of presentation. We fully understand the time challenges. And thank you, colleagues, uh, Council Vivian, Council Kivuyo, uh, 
Uh, Kan Song Konge, we are so grateful. Thank you so much. We are doing badly in terms of time. Our time was, to be honest, spent. We are now running on fumes. Uh, for the interest of membership, my apologies for keeping you beyond the time we had initially prepared for, but we can't leave without taking one or two questions from you. We had Yvette having her hand up right from the first presentation. I don't know whether we still have you, Yvette. If Yvette is not there, we can take any two questions from any colleagues and uh, one of the panelists will be able to speak to that question. Are there any questions coming from membership? Uh, Mr. Gabriel, are any questions in the chat room? Council Gabriel Achaye, do you still have you? Yes, yes, certainly. Uh, you still have me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, enduring with us. Uh, I know the time has uh, really gone, but uh, Mr. Mudreta, there are no questions in the chat room. Uh, I haven't seen any questions, so okay. I will, so over back to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gabriel Achai. That being the case, uh, I once again uh, thank the panelists for ably taking us through the session. Your time is invaluable. Your knowledge is equally uh, invaluable. Thank you once again. Uh, and with that, allow me to say uh, that uh, this marks the end of our engagement until we meet again. Thank you, East African Law Society. Thank you, Rule of Law Committee. Chairperson, uh, Mr. Ogada Evans has been with us right from the word go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, East African Law Society. I wish you a nice evening. Gabriel, back to you. Any housekeeping matters? Well, from the Secretariat of uh... The East Africa Law Society, we are really grateful for your attendance of the session. Uh, can you note that we have more of such sessions coming up and uh, we'll be sending um, certificates of participation uh, for whoever was on the session. A special thanks to the panelists and to you, the moderator. It's been an interesting session, quite informative, and we are entirely indebted to you. I uh, will be sharing the webinar report uh, via mail uh, before close of business this week, and uh, we shall definitely uh, send uh, the, 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 the certificate. So we thank you so much and have yourselves a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye.